And now let's move on and go over updates in Yemen. Discussed Yemen on the show last week and kind of uh, updated to the point where Yemen had fired or launched an attack against the UAE that involved missiles and drones. Uh, three people end up dead, all migrant workers. It does damage at a fuel depot and apparently at an airport in the UAE. Uh, initially, the the you know reports of how much damage uh, were done were, were downplayed. Also on the show last time, discussing updates on the ground in Yemen, where the UAE Bat Giants Brigade was making gains in the Shabwa and also in the Marib province of Yemen. And this uh, was you know, significant because the Houthis had made significant gains throughout these areas of Yemen for the past year. And it was this UAE Bat um, militia of about 15,000 uh, Salafists uh, moving into this region from the Hodeida region, that's the Red Sea coastal region of Yemen, that kind of turned the tides here. Also important to note that the Giants Brigade bats the Hadi government and not the Southern Transitional Council, which typically would be uh, the, the group on the ground that is backed more or less by the UAE versus Hadi, who's the internationally recognized leader of Yemen, uh, backed more by Saudi Arabia. So, you know, and there's differences between the, those two sides we don't have to get into here. And so they were making gains, and then uh, the missile strike happened, and there was a report that they were going to actually halt their offensive. And so... You know, maybe this is why we see the UAE ta or the Houthis attacking the UAE uh, because they were unable to prevent and actually, I think, killed a few civilians carrying out a missile attack against uh, the, the uh, Giants Brigade in Marib. Uh, so, again, they, they, you know, decided to, 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 you know, launch the drone attack or in the missile attack. And I believe they've actually restarted the offensive in Marib and, and ha are making some progress again the Giants Brigade. Uh, but I, I do think that that's possibly the source of the Houthis attacking the UAE, whereas in the, the Western media, it's all presented as unprovoked Iranian bat aggression. Of course, they always say the Iranian bat to Houthis. Now on this show, we've debunked that a million times. Certainly, even if they get some backing from Iran to you know describe them as a, the Iranian bat country is just absolutely absurd. Um, so then we have uh, the Houthi, the Houthi threatening to attack the Dubai Expo, and also carrying out two more missile attacks uh, on uh, the UAE during the visit of the Israeli president to the UAE. And in both of these cases, the American base in the UAE used its missile defense as well as UAE, you know, independently used their American bought uh, missile defense to engage these ballistic missiles. Uh, there hasn't been like a lot of reports and apparently the UAE is doing the best they can to censor anybody who's, you know, recording the, the interceptions and posting that online. Uh, they've summoned people uh, to police stations I guess who, who've posted that information. So we really don't know everything. Oh, sorry, everybody, for just saying the microphone there. Uh, um, we really don't know everything that's going on here, but we we you know do have an I I think an idea that the Houthis are doing this in retaliation uh, for the the UAE support of the Giants Brigade and the progress that they're making. Now, of course, there's a heavy bombing campaign against uh, northern Yemen, not just the Houthis, but the civilians of that area. And the UN is reporting that uh, January is expected to be the worst civilian uh, month in Yemen in some time, and that you know this includes the terrible airstrikes on. Uh, the, the building that houses internet for Yemen, which also resulted in three uh, children who were playing soccer being killed. And then you also had attack on the migrant facility in northern Yemen. And I don't know exactly what the death toll of that is, Connor. I heard over 80, but they were expecting that to continue to go up and hoping uh, some on the ground sources that I'll be able to contact soon will be able to help me to nail down exactly how brutal this air campaign is and, and you know just how bad the month of January was in Yemen. One last thing I, I wanted to mention here, Connor, is that a new uh, UN reports says that over the past two years, 2020 and 2021, 2,000 children who were recruited by the Houthis died in fighting. Now, this is uh, something in 
on the show, we've always been careful not to portray the, you know, Houthis as any white hat actors or anything like that. They have recruited underage uh, children into their ranks. Now, I suppose, you know, if we're talking about like a 16 year old or something like that, you know, calling them a child soldier when there's a starvation campaign against their country, you know, maybe there there's, you know, some room to, to argue there. And of course, like in the United States, you're allowed to sign up for the military at 17. And so, of course, you know, coming of age and everything like that is cultural. And there may be some flexibility in there. Uh, but of course, it, it does seem like the Houthis have enlisted younger children. Now, one thing I did want to mention that I saw in this UN report, uh, that some of these deaths occurred in uh, Sana uh, Sadaa and Sanaa, which I know for a fact are in northern Yemen, and haven't been any battlefronts in the war. And so if you know, children soldiers are, are being killed in those two places. It may not simple as just being uh, that the Houthis are enlisting, you know, kids giving them rifles and sending to the, the front lines, but rather there are kids working for the military, maybe even in a, a non, you know, gun carrying capacity. Uh, there's not a whole lot of business in Yemen. There's not a whole lot of job opportunities. And so, you know, if the, the job opportunity for the young kid is to be, you know, couriers or cooks in the, in the Houthi armed forces, and then the Saudis are dropping bombs on them while they're in the, the capital, I think we would see that as kind of a difference than, you know, some high school kid in ROTC living in Washington, D.C., getting hit with an airstrike. I don't know if we would quite say, oh, well, that's just this child soldier that was killed. Too bad for Washington for putting him in a uniform. I, you know, there may be some differences and some nuance here that's important to look at. But overall, it, it does, you know, point to not only the brutal Saudi air campaign, but also the Houthi use of children, child soldiers. Connor, I'll let you uh, finish us off here and everything going on with uh, with Yemen. Sure. Uh, so uh, all kinds of myriad aid groups and humanitarian groups are coming out and opposing, uh, you know, because the UAE is demanding that after this attack on the UAE uh, oil facilities that they that Biden go through with the Pompeo policy that they the Trump policy that they enacted, you know, in the last days of Trump's uh, administration, that the State Department redesignate the Houthis as a terrorist organization uh, and reimpose sanctions on their leadership, which would, um, you know, I mean, the point of it, it, it wouldn't change the facts on the ground at all. And that's actually what these a lot of these aid groups are saying, you know, people like Hassan Al Tayeb from the uh, Friends Committee. Um, he, you know, they say that all this is going to do is just criminalize the little humanitarian aid that is able to get through the blockade. And it's just going to make the humanitarian crisis orders of magnitude uh, worse. And that's really the point, as it always that's the point of the blockade in the first place is to put pressure on the civilian population to rescind their support for the Houthis and to, you know, kill as many people as possible, their children, and make it just as unbearable as possible. And uh, the UN is now saying that, you know, nearly uh, conservatively, and it's it's a conservative estimate, but nearly 400,000 people, and they're almost, they're mostly children, uh, uh, have been killed uh, in this way, and most of them from this, you know, systematic depri uh, deprivation. So uh, they're saying that, you no, know, nothing has changed. All their arguments that before for why Trump shouldn't do this still stand and they should not uh, go through with this policy. Now, Ted Cruz has introduced a bill uh, to, uh, you know, to go ahead and do this. And he says he want, he put it forward a bill, uh, I guess, last week to reverse the February 2021 decision by Biden's administration. Uh, to lift the sanctions on the Houthis and their leaders and the terrorism designation. And he's making it all about Iran. Predictably, he says uh, Biden made it an immediate priority to unwind pressure on Iran and their proxies, including by lifting terrorism sanctions on the Houthis and their leaders, a reckless, self-indulgent and catastrophic move. And then he goes, this appeasement predictably caused Iran to escalate its aggression across the region. And also, I'll, I'll just point out that uh, this was – Probably the best thing Biden has done on uh, Yemen policy, probably the one of the few good things he's done was roll back this policy uh, because everything he everything else he said about rescinding support for uh, 
or any support for the offensive operations and the relevant armistice. All that was absolutely a lie. And we knew by the end of April that they were the Pentagon and the foreign military sales program was still providing maintenance for Saudi warplanes, which the absence of that uh, maintenance, it would ground the Saudi Air Force uh, and end the war. So uh, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, so, uh, you know, Biden's a mass murdering liar and Cruz is, uh, wants him to be even worse because he, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how these people do this, but he now eight other senators are endorsing this bill. Uh, you could guess some of them, uh, Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio, John Barrasso, Ben Sass, Roger Marshall, Tom Tillis, Jim Inhofe. Um, you have a bunch of other members of Congress talking about this. Uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks, head of the Foreign Relate, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, says he's looking very carefully at the issue and was in conversation with other officials. He says, "I'm very concerned, and I condemn to the highest degree the Houthis and." Uh, Condemned to the highest degree, the Houthis and the utilization of drones and the strike on the UAE. So that is something we're looking at, he told Jewish Insider. Um, and Republican Senator Todd Young uh, is saying the Houthis are determined to continue the conflict uh, and exacerbate the world's uh, worst man-made humanitarian catastrophe. The idea that he's high, he's, you know, saying that using that as a way to push, uh, you know, this you know, further hawkish policies in continuation of the war is just absolutely despicable. Uh, the latest numbers from the UN that they include here are that 24.1 million people, about 80% of the population, rely on humanitarian aid and protection to survive. 50% of the population lives in extreme poverty. I believe approximately 80% of the whole civilian population lives in northern Yemen under uh, Houthi territory. So that's this whole policy would it's targeting them, the the vast vast majority of the civilian population. And there's some quotes here from. Aaron Hutchison, who's the Yemen director uh, for the Norwegian Refugee Council, who says uh, the redesignation of the group will endanger millions struggling to survive a full-blown humanitarian catastrophe. She says, we said repeatedly in the past that designating the Houthis as a terrorist organization will have far-reaching impacts on Yemen's already dire humanitarian situation, and we think the same today. The designation would come with sanctions that would harm our ability to provide life-saving aid to people in dire circumstances. The U.S. government must ensure that any sanctions do not block food, fuel, medicine, Medicines and other essential goods and services entering the country. Um, now, Hassan Al Tayeb, who I mentioned earlier, told Al Jazeera that uh, that just the talk of this is is threatening to hamper aid. Uh, they don't even have to really implement the policy. Just putting that, hinting that that could be implemented again will scare away uh, aid groups. And uh, he says um, commercial shippers uh, are already reluctant to deal with Yemen. Biden's statement that he is mulling. Uh, redesignating the Houthis could have adverse humanitarian consequences if they did not materialize. Quote, saying you're considering it really puts a lot of this critical humanitarian aid work in jeopardy. Now, uh, there's a report from from there's a piece that was written in the New Republic by Trita Parsi and Anel Shaleen from the Quincy Institute and Responsible Statecraft, and they said that they had spoken with uh, senior Anel Shaleen just did an interview about this with uh, Scott Horton that she mentioned this as well that they had token they had spoken the article says that they spoke with senior Democratic Party Senate staffers but she said I believe that she spoke with Biden officials as well or that they did and the message essentially is that they are going to provide additional support to Saudi Arabia right now. And uh, basically turn up the heat on the on the war like we've been seeing an escalation in the bombing of uh, the civilians and all over all over, uh, you know, uh, densely populated cities in the north. And that uh, basically they want to do enough damage that then the Saudis can leave, uh, you know, the war or end the war while saving face. Um, and so that was already. um you know, out there. And then there was a report that got leaked from a Lebanese newspaper uh, this week uh, that says that, or excuse me, last week, that uh, it was named Al Akbar, and they leaked document, uh, leaked details from documents on talks between Saudi officials and uh, the U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen, Timothy Lenderking, who says, and that basically it says that the the Saudis want to end the war with dignity. So I mean. Basically, that goes along with what uh, we were just hearing from Trita Parsi and and Anel Shaleen. But it the these document whatever you know the, these leaks indicate that they want to move toward a transitional uh, government and uh, as I say leave the country. But um, 
it says that Lender King suggested the U.S. isn't on board and that they emphasize that Saudi should not leave Yemen completely. They want the Saudis to remain involved in the country to a stim similar extent that they were before the war, which is why all this, you know, happened in the first place. I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, held the one man election during the Arab Spring and put uh, when the people, you know, protested against Saleh and they re they put Hadi in and they had no other person to vote for. And he stayed past uh, his uh, his term. Uh, and uh, the Houthis took the capital with Saleh in late 2014. And the war started in March of 2015. The, you know, previous leader of ahead of CENTCOM, Lloyd Austin, now the Pentagon chief, backstabbed the Houthis and took Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Al Qaeda's side. Um, and start and have waged this genocidal war ever since. So um, it's very interesting to me that the Americans insist that the Saudis, <laughs> that the Saudis want to disengage, and the Americans are saying you can't leave. So that's very, um, that's very, very interesting to uh, to see. Uh, you know more details on that. Uh, now Brett McGurk is blaming he, uh, who I mentioned earlier, national security coordinator uh, for the Middle East. Uh, on the National Security Council says that he's blaming the Houthis for everything about the war. He says that the Saudis have, uh, he goes, it takes two to get a ceasefire and the Saudis have supported UN initiatives. But, uh, you know, the UN, uh, the, I mean, Hadi, who's been on house arrest for years and years and hasn't been in power, uh, you know, for eight years is, uh, he's not the president uh, except in name only. And the uh, Houthis, have, as I say, have been, um, you know, the security force and the government in power uh, with, you know, the, the con a constituency of the vast, vast majority of ci the civilians. And, um, you know, they that that's that hasn't changed uh, throughout the whole war. So um, the I, I mean, the U.N. still is recognize internationally recognizes Hadi, but that's you know ridiculous. So of course they support uh, these U.N. pronouncements, as uh, Jason points out. Um, now the Houthis have been open to talks, as as uh, Jason says, but they want to see an end to the naval blockade and the blockade on uh, like the blockade on the ports and the blockade on the airport, uh, which was bombed again recently, and. Um, the uh, Saudis have never uh, agreed to that. As Anel Shaleen said, uh, they have never even tried it as a temporary measure to see if that could help lead to further peace talks in that transitional government that they're talking about. Um, they've just continued to starve the population without and, and bomb the country without an end in sight. Um, and the only other thing I'll point out about the UAE uh, before we wrap up is that um, uh, the U.S. is warning against Americans traveling to uh, – uh, they put out an issue, uh, a, a, a warning. They issued a warning saying that Americans should not be traveling to the country, that U.S. interests, uh, attacks on U.S. interests remain a, a concern. And um, of course, this uh, this is not going to end so long as the uh, the offensives from the UAE and the Saudis continue. Um, and so the UAE is now be going to start seeing a lot more uh, strikes on them uh, in the same way that the Saudis have in the last few years, as we've been seeing these sort of uh, cross-border strikes uh, going on back and forth. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the they retaliated because the Saudis even said before they did it that we're going to launch massive, you know, air raids and, and escalate our airstrikes. And they did. And then the Houthis started uh, firing back. And... Um, now it's going to cause a big problem for the UAE's economy because they've, you know, for a long time they've been considered a relatively stable country and a big, you know, center for for business and international commerce. And now that's being jeopardized. Although they say that, oh no, it's not going to be the new normal, and they're boasting about their, uh, you know, their advanced uh, missile defense systems or their, and all of this. But um, it's just, uh, you know, it appears that that that, that the Houthis' policy is. Uh, that they are going to continue to do this until they can reach uh, an end to the blockade and 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 you know move toward um, some kind of uh, peace deals, which I think is in the interests of of course of all parties. There's no military solution to this, um, and so uh, but really, as as uh, Scott Horton always points out, the Americans are really the only ones right now who can shut this thing off if they decide to.